Welcome to our second video on daylighting. In a previous video we explored the nature of solar motion as a function of time of day and time of year and latitude on the planet. And now we want to talk about what the sun angles mean to architecture. When we start a design problem, we try to define some design goals and typically once we do that there are some design implications regarding the configuration of the building or in this case the configuration of daylighting apertures. So among the design goals that we've set here are we want to maximize lighting electricity savings from the daylighting. Maximizing can be a very vague word and anything we maximize is always within the context of other factors. So this is not so much a precise statement of a goal as it is a general aspiration. Um, maximizing might mean though, for example, if we do a roofing system where we can orient the glass in whatever direction we deem most appropriate, we can size the apertures and space them appropriately, uh, we will get in the high 90 percentile of elimination of the lighting electricity during daylight hours. We will clearly not do so well for wall systems where the amount of light trails off when we get further from the wall and when we oversize the apertures then we run the risk of having overheating or glare near the boundary of the building. So how we define maximum lighting electricity savings uh, varies according to the daylighting system we're dealing with. Uh, we'd like an inexpensive, reliable electric lighting system that uses on-off switching. Um, dimmers cost more money, they tend to be less stable, they're less durable, and they also pull a substantial amount of power even when the daylighting is more than adequate to illuminate the space. So if we can design a really good daylighting system, that provides adequate light during almost all hours, then the electric lighting system can be fairly simple and inexpensive. And also once it's turned off, we know it's turned off and we know that we're saving 100% of that energy. Uh, a third factor, which we'll talk about is we like the daylighting system to not aggravate the cooling energy consumption. In most commercial buildings where we're designing for daylighting, um, the second most important load behind, day, behind lighting electricity is cooling electricity. So one of the things we don't want to do is aggravate the cooling loads. So those are some design goals and now we can talk about design implications and what those might mean in terms of the configuration of the daylighting apertures. Um, maximum lighting electricity savings say that the daylight must provide, must be adequate, or in other words, provide satisfactory illumination during almost all daytime hours. That implies that we're going to be relying on diffuse skylight, not beam sunlight, as the appropriate source. Even in a place like Phoenix, 30% of the time you don't have beam sunlight even during the daytime. And in most climates, say in the eastern United States or the midwestern United States, uh, we'll have clouds, cloud cover about half the time. So if your system is relying on beam sunlight and the system, basically the electric lights go on whenever there's not enough daylight, then beam sunlight is not the source of choice because half of the time it's just not there. The fact that we're relying on diffuse skylight means that the apertures must be ample in area to collect adequate illumination because we all know that diffuse skylight is only about a tenth as strong as beam sunlight. Now the fact that we have fairly ample apertures, and by the way, let me define what that means. It means approximately 20% of the floor area will be provided in the form of glazing 
or the aperture areas must be about 20% of the floor area. This is a rough number which holds pretty well um, but that's what I would call ample and I think most people would and when you have ample areas of glazing like that the last thing you want to do is to orient them wrong so that your daylighting system starts to aggravate the cooling energy consumption. So this design goal in conjunction with this series of design implications when we fold all that together we say the daylighting apertures must avoid beam sunlight during the cooling season. So in our previous video where we talked about sun angles we got some kind of a, a glimpse of what we might need to do in order to avoid beam sunlight during the cooling season. Before we go back to that though, I want to talk about um, what kind of quantification we can give to not just sun angles, but the intensity of uh, the daylight as a function of time of day and time of year on various kinds of surfaces because we're going to have to make some decisions about how to orient these apertures and these apertures become effectively like surfaces they receive a certain amount of light uh, as a function of time of day, time of year, latitude, and so forth. So this is a view of some instrumentation on the roof of one of our buildings. You'll notice each one of these little black uh, elements with a white pa uh, patch in the middle of it is a photometer. That white element is a filter that represents the response of the human eye, and these are research grade instruments. You'll notice here we have one facing south, one north, one east, one northeast, and so forth. So we have eight sensors facing in eight directions um, on a white surface to uh, indicate what kind of behavior we might get if we put, uh, say, a vertical aperture in a sawtooth on a white roof. Here we have some that are sloped at 45 degrees facing south, north, east, and on the other side west. And then we repeat all that on a black ground plane, the theory being that you might have a black roof, you might have a white roof, you might have grass or something. You can have various elements that have certain reflectivities and those need to be accounted for in the design of your daylighting system. We also have a, on this roof precision spectral pyranometers that are measuring the total energy content or heat content of the sunlight. And over here we have a photometer which is again measuring the visible portion of the spectrum facing up towards the sky. So this is measuring what uh, incident energy and or excuse me incident light would occur for a horizontal aperture in the roof of a building. Here we have it bare so this measuring beam sunlight and diffuse skylight and then we have one facing upward which has a shadow band on it which is blocking the beam sunlight but allowing the measurement of the diffuse skylight. Um, all of these instruments uh, fed into a computer. This is where the instruments are being calibrated. Um, they're being fed into a computer uh, to record over the course of a few years the incident uh, light on surfaces of various orientations. Okay, going back to our sun angle issues, uh, here we have the summer sun cone uh, at about 36 degrees latitude. Here we have the winter sun cone um, at the same latitude. And you'll notice in this sort of diagrammatic notion of a building, we have a horizontal aperture. Uh, this aperture, by the way, would be horizontal even if it had a pyramidal acrylic dome over it or um, a round acrylic dome. Uh, it would still be defined by the boundary here and this would be regarded as a horizontal aperture. So we're showing the sun angles at 36 degree latitude during a summer solstice and the winter solstice on this horizontal aperture. And <clears throat> there are lots of ways of processing this data and there's huge amounts of data. 
uh, in this particular instance. Each one of these specs represents a 10 minute time average and this is all the data for uh, the month of June and this is all the data for the month of December. Uh, so we're sort of taking June as the uh, representative uh, summer condition and December is a fairly representative winter condition. And of course the summer solstice does occur around June 21st and the winter solstice around December 21st. So this is a good start to just sort of examine the data and see what's going on. So here we have illuminance on the surface, which in this case is a horizontal aperture. So this is illuminance on a horizontal surface. Um, and in each of these time intervals there will be 30 specs corresponding to that because there are 30 days in the month of June um, for the corresponding time interval in December there will be 31 because there are 31 days in December. One of the things you'll notice is that there are 3.84 times as much light as on average uh, in a month of, in the month of June as on average on a December day and to first order the amount of radiation also or heat content goes in proportion to the amount of light that's not absolutely precise but it's very close uh, so we have roughly three times as much light and heat collected by this horizontal aperture in the month of June as we do in the month of December this is the exact opposite of what we want from both a thermal and a psychological point of view you don't want this blast of light and heat during the summertime when you're already overheated but you really would love to have more light and heat during wintertime when we feel deprived of both and in this case you'll notice that this aperture is accepting much less light and heat during December than it is during June. So one of the things we probably don't want is horizontal apertures at least ones that aren't controlled in some way and this would be an example of something we wouldn't want to do. An all glass building with lots of glass facing upward you're beginning to see some acknowledgement even in this design though of the problems with with overhead beam sunlight during a summertime and that the shallow sloped glass is tinted much darker than the vertical glass. Um, this still of course doesn't begin to solve the problem with this building which during a summertime the air conditioning system just drones um, and is terribly loud and also you can't possibly be comfortable because if you're sitting there on a June day and the beam sunlight is coming in and you are comfortable when a cloud comes over you're actually suddenly very cold because the air temperature in the space has been cranked down to keep a good thermal balance on your body and when that source of beam radiation from the sun goes away you suddenly get really cold. There's, there's, just an, a, there's nothing that any HVAC system can do to fix this problem. This is a design problem where that much overhead glass does not make sense from a thermal and an energy point of view. Um, <clears throat> this can also happen with fabric structures like this one the manufacturers will often say well we can control the amount of transmission uh, through it by adjusting the content of the fabric uh, and the number of scattering centers and and that's true they can fix those initially the problem is that if they um, control the transmiss transmissivity to the point that you have about the right amount of light when there's beam sunlight then when the cloud comes over you only have a tenth of the amount of light that you need and likewise if you size it to get enough light when there's a, a cloud covering the sun in other words you're living off of diffuse skylight then when the cloud moves away you have suddenly a factor of 10 in your thermal overload on the space so 
in spite of the fact that we can get some degree of control over the amount of heat that's transmitted through this roof, um, it's, it's not a dynamic control and therefore does not solve the problem. This is the interior of that building. Um, and normally I'm a huge fan of daylighting, but I will tell you there are cer certain, certain circumstances where it's not that great. And one of them is where you're trying to sell product. You would like to have the light incident on the product and you'd like the spectral content of your lamp that's illuminating the product to bring out the best colors in it. Um, in this case, this extremely diffuse environment doesn't necessarily illuminate the product in the best way. The other uh, dilemma is that sometimes people get distracted by this tent structure and they don't tend to look at product. So not every instance is an example of where daylighting is the best or the easiest thing to do. Another example is this material. This is a translucent uh, paneling for the roof and uh, I've been in this space very on a number of occasions and you almost never see anyone there because it's too cold during the winter time and it's too hot during the summer time but this material is touted with the same argument that its transmissivity can be adjusted it is adjustable initially but then it doesn't compensate for the huge dynamic variations in the amount of beam sunlight so as a summary, we generally would say that unshaded skylights are thermally very undesirable and psychologically undesirable uh, in buildings. <clears throat> so let's look at another orientation. This would be east facing glass. Here we see the summer sun cone, the winter sun cone. Uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of hours in the morning when there's beam sunlight on this aperture. Um, not so much during winter time. So when we plot it, uh, we see this is the June data, this is the December data. So in the mornings we get this strong pulse of beam sunlight. If we size the aperture to give us good daylighting for this sort of diffuse level, then when the beam sunlight is out it represents a huge thermal overload. If we size it so that this gives about the amount of right, right amount of light, then once the beam sunlight goes away, the amount of light that's available is totally inadequate. So also these low sun angles tend to cause really extreme glare. Now some people really like a certain amount of east facing glass because human beings set their neurological clocks by uh, daylight and some beam sunlight in the morning can be a very cheerful thing, especially if it doesn't wake you up too early, like before you're ready to get up. <clears throat> but from a thermal point of view and a glare point of view, these are really bad angles in terms of glare. And from a thermal point of view, this pulse is occurring in the month of June, which is not favorable. <clears throat> when we compare June to December, there is about two and a half times as much light on an average June day and two and a half times as much heat. Um, I don't have the diagram here, but if we were looking at west facing glass, this image would just be the mirror image and west facing um, is particularly deleterious in residences where people are coming home right about the time that the maximum solar gain is occurring in the building. This is um, a west-facing facade. Um, this is a museum in Indianapolis, and the day I happened to be there, there was a little store here. This is a children's museum, and they were putting aluminum foil up over the window here because the overheating was causing the chocolates to melt in the store. And I just put that in to illustrate the point that uh, west facing and east facing glass are really problematical during the summertime. Okay, so let's look at something like uh, an aperture that's facing northeast. Um, you'll notice here we have the summer sun cone, the winter sun cone, and for reasons I'm not totally clear on, uh, my 
equinox needles have returned in this image, but that's okay. We're mainly focusing on summer and winter. You'll notice we're getting almost no winter light here, just a tiny amount really early in the morning, but we're getting lots of summer light. So when we plot our data, we see that in the month of June, we get this really big pulse of heat and light, and then it tapers off in the afternoon. Uh, in the winter time, we get this little blip right here, and then it's pretty much diffuse skylight the rest of the time. That little blip is these rays early in the morning of beam sunlight. So in other words, for northeast facing glazing, you get blasted during the summertime, but you get essentially no beam sunlight during the wintertime. So it's not a very cheerful solution. And the same could be said of northwest. Here's another one that we would like to avoid. Um, tilted north facing glazing, which has been implemented many times. And the argument goes something like the following. Uh, we tilted the glass to the north to avoid the beam sunlight. But the north sky is relatively dark, so we tilted it back so we could get more diffuse skylight. This diagram, though, indicates that when you tilt that aperture back again, you get all the summertime beam sunlight. You get none during wintertime, but you get it all during the summertime. So this north-facing uh, aperture is the about the worst that you can possibly imagine. It looks something like this. We get huge amounts of solar gain all day long in the month of June. In the month of December, we have essentially diffuse skylight. And by the way, some of these high spots here are just when a really bright puffy white cloud happens to be contributing some extra light there. Um, so from a thermal and a psychological point of view, this is about as bad as you can do. Now, you'll still find these things published, and you need to read them critically. So here is uh, a, an out, a space which has tilted north-facing glass, and then on top of that, it's, it's violated all our other rules by putting in massive amounts of west-facing glass. So from every thermal point of view in a residential space, this is violating every rule and doing about the worst thing you can possibly do. In this particular instance, though, that's the Pacific Ocean out there. It's locked in at about 55 degrees, and the breeze blows off the Pacific Ocean uh, about 50 or 51 weeks out of the year. So in other words, essentially, this building has a prime cooling system, which consists of coming home, opening these doors, and some doors on the other side, and then that cross ventilation will make this space comfortable in about five minutes. If you do this kind of thing in most environments, though, in the United States, it will be thermally a disaster. There will be very few times of the year when the space is really comfortable to be in, because it's gonna be really cold during the winter time, and really hot during the summertime. Okay, so those are a whole bunch of things not to do. Now we need to find some things we can do. And this is an example. A south-facing aperture gets lots of beam sunlight during the wintertime, which is thermally and psychologically what you want. You do need to account for glare, so there need to be optical elements to disperse the light or deflect the light so it goes somewhere where it's useful. Um, in the morning and afternoon, there is no beam sunlight incident on this aperture. The sun only dips into the southern sky around 10 or so in the morning, maybe a little earlier than that. But all these uh, needles of beam sunlight are incident on this glass at something of a grazing angle. So when we look at this data, <coughs> we see that for the first time, we're getting the kind of thermal balance we want in that the month of December, we're actually getting more light than we are during a summertime. Also, this little hump on here is that bit of beam sunlight that's incident on that glazing surface. So if we wanted to get rid of this hump and have nice, well-behaved June light with no beam sunlight, which we said was one of our big goals during a cooling season, we want to elim eliminate 
beam sunlight on our apertures. The way we do that is we go put out an overhang and we block that. So this brings up the concept of an effective aperture. And let me go back again and say, by the way, that this is one of our best apertures. It's uh, vertical glass with an overhang facing south. Now, the key thing here is the concept of effective aperture. In essence, the aperture is not vertical. It's actually sloped forward, the effective aperture is. And the overhang is what's allowing that to happen. So, for example, on a sawtooth roof like this, we may have a configuration of this sort. Uh, generally speaking, this overhang should provide a profile angle of 16 to 24 degrees off of vertical in order to block the worst part of the summer sun while still admitting the low angle winter sun and as much diffuse skylight as possible. Uh, this guideline, by the way, would be different if this was just view glazing. View glazing, you would put the overhang out further to provide more protection. But here we have a sort of issue of diminishing returns in that the further we push out this aperture, the more diffuse skylight we're blocking and the larger the aperture has to be and then the larger the overhang has to be. And at some point, it's just not worth it to push that to the extreme. You'll notice here, we've drawn this as if this is vertical glass, which is the customary way to do that. On the other hand, if the glass came across at an angle like this, there would be less area of glass and also less envelope area to lose heat. So we could take this same profile angle, the same effective aperture, but move the glass off and it would look something like that. So we still have this overhang that's creating this profile angle between the lower edge of the overhang and the lower edge of the admitting aperture. In this case, the glass though is sloped. Um, this has certain advantages, like this is a right angle and that's a right angle. So from a constructional point of view, this is not a bad way to do things. But you don't want that sloped glass if it's not protected with this overhang. And this is an image of what that might look like in this case uh, without a very large overhang. This is actually preferable for a north-facing orientation. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we can also use the combination of north of south and north facing glass. Um, on the north side we'll have only as much overhang as we need to protect everything from water. On the south side we'll have a slightly larger overhang. Here the profile angle has been diminished somewhat because there's less glazing to create problematical thermal overload. <coughs> So if we're going to face glazing towards the north and do a sawtooth, uh, we might want to run the glass along this line. And now we don't need a profile angle of anything other than a vertical plane to create the effective aperture because there's very little beam sunlight from the north that would actually get past this vertical aperture plane. And it will occur around 5 a.m. in the morning and just before sunset at night so it tends to not be terribly intense and it tends to be occurring at a time when the building is less likely to be occupied. So that concludes our second day lighting video titled What Do Sun Angles Mean to Architecture? <laughs>